It's great to be joined today by Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in California, a research organization interested in life beyond Earth. Seth, it's so good to speak to you. We've been speaking about uh, the the search for life beyond Earth off and on for a while. I think first we should sort of introduce our audience, people who may not be familiar with some of these terms. Uh, first, let's start with the Drake equation, which is generally if, if my very limited understanding of this serves me at all. Uh, it's it's sort of an equation which seeks to approximate the probability that there is life beyond Earth in the universe, sort of based on some assessments we can make with regard to some variables. Is that right? Well, it's approximately right, actually. The Drake equation, which was formulated by Frank Drake, whose office is down the hall here from where I'm sitting, uh, in 1961, so that's a long time ago, uh, is designed to, in fact, estimate the number of societies that are out there right now that are broadcasting signals that we could pick up with our antennas. So that was the intention of the Drake Equation, just to give some idea about whether this idea of doing what Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact, trying to eavesdrop on alien signals, whether that has any chance of success. And so when we think about that, uh, what we very quickly come to realize is some of the numbers are huge and much of this is based around very big numbers the 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 uh, number of potentially habitable planets and our guesses about the possible size of the universe and it's basically a numbers game right in other words some of these numbers are just so big that one might guess that there are other societies out there well that's right that doesn't really come so much from the drake equation but simply from primarily the results of uh, looking for planets in the last 20 years, actually. When I was a kid, you know, you could go to the Hayden Planetarium in New York and, you know, they weren't quite clear whether there were a lot of planets out there or not. They didn't know. And uh, some theories suggested that, you know, planets might be extraordinarily rare. Well, uh, in the last 20 years, we found out that's wrong, actually. <laughs> there, you know, just almost every star has planets, right? 70, 80 percent at least. OK, so there are a lot of planets. What we've also learned in the past couple of years, uh, two, three, four years, is that maybe one in five of those planets uh, is, or I should say, not one in five of the planets, but one in five of the stars out there has a planet that's sort of like the Earth. In other words, it could have oceans, atmospheres, it could have life. That's an astounding discovery because that means the number of worlds that are, that are cousins of the Earth, if you will, uh, in our own galaxy is probably tens of billions, maybe a hundred billion. That's a big number, and that's just our galaxy. Talk to us a little bit about the concept of eavesdropping on radio signals as a way to ascertain what might be out there. I, I, whenever we talk about this, I get emails from people saying, well, the, there's no rule that says that the way to figure out if there are other societies out there must be eavesdropping on radio signals. I, is that in some way limiting our assessment of how we might find other societies or is there a particular reason why this is what has been the focus well there's certainly a reason uh, i don't know whether it's limiting our chances of success it might very well be doing that depending on what the aliens are doing but of course we don't know what the aliens are doing so we do the best experiment that we can think of uh, radio waves which are just another form of light Radio waves travel at the speed of light, okay? So you can't send information any faster than that, at least not according to relativity. So, you know, it's fast. The other thing about radio is that radio waves go right through the dust and the gas that uh, sits between the stars in our galaxy, every other galaxy. So that's good. Uh, so, you know, you think about, well, how could you communicate? You know, you could try and send mail. You could have rockets uh, zipping around carrying mail or something like that. But rockets are slow. Uh, people send me ideas every, every week. And they say, oh, how about gravity waves or neutrinos? I mean, they have all sorts of ideas about how to send information around. But nothing is faster than radio waves, and it certainly does work. So, you know, we figure no matter what else an alien society might be doing, they're probably using radio for something. So <laughs> that's what we look for it. Let's introduce our audience to um, uh, another side of this discussion, which is the Fermi paradox. And although I've attempted to explain it in the past, since we have you here, I might as well allow you to explain what the Fermi paradox is in a way that is likely far clearer than any than the way I'd be able to explain it. Well, this is a, a, a 
reportedly due to a comment that was made by Enrico Fermi, who was a famous Italian-American physicist. Back in 1950, he was having lunch at the cafeteria at Los Alamos Labs down in New Mexico, apparently. And, uh, you know, he said to the two other physicists who were eating lunch with him, he said, well, so where is everybody? Now, what he meant by that was not, you know, why didn't other people join us for lunch? But he had simply done the very simple calculation in his head about how quickly any society that was advanced enough and interested enough to colonize the Milky Way galaxy, how fast they could do that. They could do it very quickly, uh, 30, 40 million years. Now, you know, you may not think that's very quick, but in terms of the history of the universe, that's a very short period of time. So I think maybe a useful analogy here would be to consider what happened after 1492. Columbus discovers the Americas, and within 30 years, 30 years, uh, there were Spaniards all up and down the coast of, you know, uh, certainly South America and, and parts of North America as well. Okay, so that went very, very quickly. Once you started a little bit of colonization, it, it, it was fast. That's what Fermi was saying. He said, look, the, the, you know, the universe has been around since the Big Bang. There's been plenty of time for any advanced society to colonize the galaxy, and yet we don't see any evidence of that. We don't see aliens everywhere. So, you know, where are they? That was his comment. And that's become known as the Fermi paradox because you expect to see a lot of alien activity and you don't. But that's been widely criticized, has it not, on a number of levels in terms of, well, if you actually consider the size of the universe, there are actually quite reasonable explanations for why alien life may exist, but it may not have reached us. Well, there are certainly lots of explanations. You're quite right about that. Uh, whether they're reasonable or not, or not depends on who you are. I mean, how you feel about it, because uh, some people, I mean, you can argue that, well, it takes a lot of energy to send a rocket ship from one star system to another and colonize its planets. And maybe nobody's interested in doing that. I mean, that, you know, that's that's alien sociology about which we know very little. So you don't really know whether they consider it too expensive or not. And the, I think that the strength of the Fermi paradox mostly lies uh, with the fact that not every society has to eventually want to colonize. It's, it's good enough if just one of them in the whole history of, uh, of, of the Milky Way galaxy, if just one of them decided to do it, then you would see the results today. That's kind of the argument. Uh, you know, I don't lie awake at night worrying about the Fermi paradox because I think that, you know, it, it, it doesn't really tell you very much. But it's certainly an interesting idea. I've read a little bit about the uh, suggestion that has been made, and I guess I'll, I'll leave it at calling it a suggestion and, and allow you to elaborate, that maybe there is something that we humans on Earth have not yet learned about what happens when we become slightly better, or maybe somewhat significantly, significantly better than we currently are at exploring the universe that can hinder a society or potentially even destroy humanity and that maybe that explains why even if there are and have been many other societies in the universe we've not heard from them because when they get a little bit better than we are right now at sending signals out so to speak something really bad happens what do you think of that well I, that's kind of speculative i'm not I'm, if without knowing what sort of things might happen I can't really say that there's a lot of probability that it will happen. I mean, we're at a level now where we could, if we really tried, I suppose, uh, obliterate uh, Homo sapiens. I, I think that'd be hard to do, but, you know, there are people who think we, we do have that capability now. And we can broadcast into space, not, not terribly well, but, you know, pretty well, given that we've only invented radio 100 years ago. So... Uh, I don't know about more advanced societies. They may have, you know, more effective weapons and maybe they wipe themselves out on a regular basis. Nonetheless, you're still stuck with this idea that, well, but do all of them do that? I mean, maybe 90 percent of them do it. But if there's 10 percent that don't, then maybe we should hear from those guys. So, I, you know, this this kind of, well, let's speculate about alien sociology. I mean, that's a lot of fun, <laughs> but you know, there are no data. So you don't really know anything about it. What's most exciting to you right now about what's going on at SETI? Well, to me, I think it's the development of new technology. That's almost always the case because we haven't found a signal yet. But on the other hand, the speed of the search keeps getting uh, faster. Uh, it keeps going up. And that's because of developments mostly in digital electronics. Uh, so we're going through the sky faster and faster all the time. And that means in the next 20 years, assuming there's money to do this, in the next 20 years, 
uh, we'll be able to maybe re- do a reconnaissance of roughly a million star systems. Uh, I don't know if looking at a million of them for radio waves is adequate to find them, but sort of intuitively, it sounds to me like that might be the right number. If it is the right number, then, then we'll know something within 20 years. Whenever we speak to folks involved in the work you're doing, or even when we've interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson or so many other people, invariably there's some portion of our audience who says, David, you know, this is all well and good and somewhat interesting, but we have so many problems here on Earth that we really should not be investing money in NASA, in SETI. The money should really be focused on solving our problems in the here and now. Uh, I, I tend to reject that argument, but I'd be interested in hearing from you. What is the case to be made for why actually doing this type of work and exploration and properly funding it actually does relate to the problems in the here and now on Earth? Yeah, well, the people who say that would have said that at any time in history, right? They would not have funded Columbus. They would not have funded uh, Captain Cook. The British Admiralty sends Captain Cook into the South Pacific, map all the islands, learn something about the cultures. It was exploration. They wouldn't have funded any of that. And that those societies die. The societies that don't, uh, that don't do something in, in the field of exploration or research or something, those all go away, right? That's the, the lesson from history. You can say, oh, well, we've got problems here. To begin with, SETI is not funded by the taxpayers. It's funded by donations. So, you know, it's not their money anyhow. But I mean, that, that's a technical point. I think the greater point and the one that, that really disturbs me when people say this mm-hmm. is that they would not have funded Mozart. Why should we pay for some guy to write music? We've got people dying in the streets of hunger, right? Why, uh, again, all the great explorers, they, they, they wouldn't have gotten their money. And, and you would just wait for somebody else to do that exploration and then maybe you'd become a colony of them. Uh, I, I just think that the extension of knowledge is maybe the one thing we do that always has value. We've been speaking with Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in California. So great to talk to you. Thanks very much, David.